What's good, YouTube? It's Mary Squid back in another Squid So I wanted to dive into a little bit more competitive content on the channel. I know there's like a bit of a gap in the Yu-Gi-Oh community for actually finding these resources, and it can be very daunting and really difficult for newer players to actually come in the environment and learn, you know, how to play at a competitive level. So one thing I realized is that, you know, in the other communities like Smash Brothers, Pokemon VGC, the FGC, there's so many good guides for getting into it. So I thought I'd go ahead and create some of these guides. Um, this will definitely benefit you if you're a competitive player as well, just as a refresher. I'm sure there's some things that you can learn. And I'm happy to announce that these slides are actually also available on my newly launched Patreon. So if you guys want to follow Competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, definitely give that a check out. You can uh, take a look at these slides and download them there. But without further ado, let's just dive right in. So, how to side deck for competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! We got a table of contents today. We're gonna go over a couple of things, a quick little intro, and then we're gonna talk about siding for going first, going second, talk about hand traps versus board breakers, and then have some general tips for you guys at the end. Okay, so in the intro, the beginning, what is a side deck? Well, a side deck is basically also known as a sideboard in other TCGs, <laughs> like Magic the Gathering or Pokemon, I believe. I don't know if Pokemon has one, but Magic does. It's basically a separate deck of 15 cards that can be used to swap with cards with your main deck interchangeably between duels. So a match in Yu-Gi-Oh is a best two out of three, which comprises of three games or three duels, as you would call them, if you're used to watching the anime. And in between these games, you can actually take cards from your 40 to 60 card main deck and swap them with any card or cards from your 15 card side deck. And generally the use Fullness of this is that, you know, you sometimes have bad matchups or cards that directly counter yours, and you definitely have to kind of put in cards to mitigate that, as well as just countering your opponent's deck entirely, right? Like if you want to uh, counter certain cards in their engine that they're playing, you know, their cards like Dimension Shifter that kind of banish the entire graveyard. So graveyard reliant decks like Fire Kings or Zombies really struggle against that type of strategy. And in a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, each player has a maximum of three minutes to side deck between the duels. So after a player concedes, you go directly to your side deck and you start swapping cards. And then after within three minutes, both players present their decks and say, I'm ready, I've sided, so let's uh, continue playing. And of course, you have to make sure that your side deck actually matches the size of your current deck after you're siding. So 15 card side deck has to remain 15 card sides after you are finished exchanging cards from the main deck and the side deck. It's not like in Magic where you can put your entire side deck into your deck and have like a 75 card deck after siding. Nope, in Yu-Gi-Oh, they have to be uh, the same number after you're finished siding. Now, certain cards are obviously very good against certain decks and can be very effective for a given matchup. For example, Cosmic Cyclone is very good against traps with uh, Floodgates, so Floodgate type decks, um, but it's not very good against decks that are very combo heavy and put up like Monster Interruption that have very little spells or traps for you to uh, remove with Cosmic Cyclone, right? So it's very, very specific, some of these cards, but also having cards to deal with certain like Glass Cannon decks that might exist in the format that kind of plague the entire format. For example, we had a card like Mystic Mine, which effectively locked down players from playing the game entirely. So uh, players were forced to side deck cards like Cosmic Cyclone that entirely got rid of the problem. So siding going first and going second, there's actually a bit of a subtle difference between going first and going second. And that affects the cards that you actually want to bring in for side decking. Uh, this has definitely evolved over time as the game has become more and more power crept and faster. You know, back in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, we're talking like maybe 15, 20 years ago, the duels were decided in a lot of turns, right? You could have 10, 20, sometimes even 30 turns. And side decking going first and second didn't really matter as much because cards generally still had usage, bring them into your deck because of the prevalence of the turns that uh, the game's comprised of. But nowadays, the modern Yu-Gi-Oh metagame is so fast that games can basically be decided within one or two turns, which I know this is kind of scary for newer players, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. There are so many interactions that actually happen through those turns. It's more about the number of interactions as opposed to the number of turns. If you guys play uh, fighting games, it's a lot like Marvel vs. Capcom 3 as opposed to, you know, other slower fighting games like uh, Street Fighter or Tekken that require some setup and back and forth. Well, Yu-Gi-Oh! is a lot more faster paced where it kind of has some touch of death style gameplay that uh, you really have to interact with before your opponent gets that touch of death and wins so that's why it's really important to play cards that are better going first or going second and that's really depending on who goes first so uh there's certain cards that are obviously very very good going first but also certain cards that are very bad 
going first, right? They're basically useless unless you go second. For example, change of heart. It says target one monster your opponent controls, take control of it until the end phase. But this does basically nothing if you're going first and your opponent, you know, doesn't control any monsters, right? What am I going to do with change of heart? I'm just looking at my hand and it doesn't fulfill any role. I cannot activate it on my first turn. There are also cards like Anti-Spell Fragrance that do basically nothing going second because it's a trap that needs to be set going first. Going first, it's very, very powerful because your opponent, uh, upon their turn, they have a lot of spell cards that they can't really use. But, you know, going second, I'm staring at an Anti-Spell Fragrance in my hand and my opponent has already activated all of their spell cards. They have a huge board of monsters that I have to get rid of and Anti-Spell Fragrance just does not fulfill that role. So that's why certain cards are good going first and going second. So going first in Yu-Gi-Oh! Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! involves setting up powerful combos filled with, you know, tons of monsters and interruptions. We call these end boards. So yeah, they're the end final product of the board that spawns out of whatever monsters uh, helped you uh, get to that combo. And generally going first, the player that goes first dictates the entire tempo of the game because of the power level of Yu-Gi-Oh! So going first, they want to maximize the chances for them to actually resolve their combos and set up an end board that can basically not be broken by siding cards in going second. So the player going second ideally uh, cannot break it. And you can do this by protecting your final end board. So siding in cards that would actually protect the final end board, cards like Solemn Judgment that said, when a monster would be summoned or a spar trap card is activated, you pay half your life points to negate that summon or the activation of the card. So this is really good to protect your end board against things that might threaten it. Or uh, better yet, you can also side in cards that prevent your opponent from playing in case they stop you from getting to your final end board. There are a lot of uh, what we call hand traps in Yu-Gi-Oh! Cards that allow you to be activated on your opponent's turn, even when it's not your turn, that can interact and trade with your opponent's cards. So in that case, you know, if we side in cards that can prevent our opponent from playing, then that's equally as good because when they stop us from playing, we can set these cards and then that kind of stops them from playing. And, uh, you know, cards like Solemn Judgment can negate cards that can threaten your end board. And then there's cards like Summon Limit that stops your opponent from playing, period. So that can be good when you have an end board, which already protect, pre prevents your opponent from playing. But also it can be good when your opponent stops you from playing and you stop them back and then you get another turn. Going second in Yu-Gi-Oh! So this is uh, a lot different than going first. Obviously, due to the lack of a proper resource system, it's not like Magic the Gathering where we have land cards that we have to tap for mana to pay for costs. I know they have something similar in the Final Fantasy TCG as well as One Piece and Pokemon, obviously the energy cards. Well, in Yu-Gi-Oh! The player going first can basically play as many cards as they want and easily flood the entire board with monsters. There's basically very little uh, things that restrict you from playing besides the normal summon, which is the only hard mechanic mechanical restriction you can only normal summon once per turn and um, also cards that say you can only activate this card once per turn so a lot of the newer cards are hard once per turn abilities because Konami realized hey this game doesn't have a resource system back in the day people could activate cards like pot of greed up to three times and draw you know a bunch of cards and it was absolutely bonkers but nowadays newer cards all say you can only activate them once per turn so that is kind of like a um, in place placeholder restriction that Konami kind of came up with now, going second, you want to maximize your chances to prevent or break an opposing end board, right? You want to prevent your opponent from either playing or you want to break whatever the heck they put up on the board. And to prevent them from playing, generally we play cards like Hand Traps, like we just talked about. So cards like Ash Blossom, you know, Nibiru, Valor, Imperm, Droll. These cards are all really, really useful for that purpose. And on the flip side, you have what are called board breakers. So cards that actually serve a purpose of breaking your opponent's board. So they're direct one-for-one -one removal or, you know, one-for-more removal. Cards like Harpy's Feather Duster, which destroys all spells and traps your opponent controls. Cards like Cosmic Cyclone, which we talked about, just removing a, a spell trap at a quick play uh, speed. Cards like Change of Heart, Raigeki, Dark Hole. These cards all kind of fulfill that purpose. And the difference between hand traps is that hand traps can be used basically at any point during the game because they're effectively fast, quick effects. Whereas uh, Board Breakers are basically cards that you typically can only use during your turn. So it's a lot like kind of uh, sorceries in Magic the Gathering that can only be activated during the main phase uh, ver versus like uh, hand traps, which are more like instants that can be used, you know, at any point during the game by tapping for mana. So now let's get to the next section, siding for going first. Diving in a little bit more heavy. So siding cards that help you push through your main engine plays, despite your opponent trying to stop you with hand traps or whatever the heck else. So we might want to side in cards like Cross Out Designator and Called by the Grave that actually interact favorably with hand traps. Both of these cards say that you can negate the effect of a card. So when your opponent activates a specific card, we can negate that specific card uh, by activating these cards out of our hand. 
You can also play extenders that allow you to recover. So these don't trade directly one for one with the hand traps, but rather they are a bit more uh, broader usage that you can use them, you know, in different board states, but you can also use them when your opponent trades with one of your monsters to try and resurrect another one of your monsters from your graveyard, like Monster Reborn, and it allows you to keep playing or uh, other cards that allow you to summon monsters on the board in spite of your opponent stopping you from doing so. Because generally in Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, the more monsters you put on the board, the better, because you can uh, just link climb and, you know, synchro summon, fusion summon, XYZ summon, and build a huge board. But you need multiple monsters to do these things generally. So that's why extenders kind of help you out when your opponent stop you. You can also side in cards like we previously talked about, strengthening and protecting the end board, or uh, cards that can keep you safe in case you get stopped. So some limit kind of does that. For example, if your opponent plays Dimension Shifter and you're playing a graveyard-based deck and you kind of have to pass your turn because you cannot use your graveyard to play, then you could set a card like Summon Limit, which also prevents your opponent from playing. So you're kind of safe, right? You get another turn when Dimension Shifter kind of expires and then you can continue playing as you normally would have. There's also cards like Solemn Strike, which can trade with your opponent's starter cards. Uh, it shuts off their engine, and it's very useful both with a board or without a board. It can still be uh, very, very defensive and keep you safe. So continuing our notion about siding for going first, Going first, there are very little hard interruptions if you think about it, okay? So most hand traps only trade directly with card effects and not with card advantage themselves. And I think this is mostly a balancing thing because if you have powerful hand traps that uh, are in the format like Cyframe Gear Gamma, which both negate the effect and destroy the monster, they typically end up becoming too powerful for the player going second. So that's why Cyframe Gear Gamma was actually restricted to one on the banned list because uh, this card was very, very powerful and oftentimes resolving it meant that the player going second was heavily favored to win because they destroyed the card as well as negating the effect. So rather than that being a thing, the rest of the hand traps generally are a negative one because you're trading one card to negate basically something coming out of thin air, aka the monster effect. So effect failure, you have to discard it for a cost from your hand, and this uh, trades with the monster effect that your opponent controls, but your opponent still keeps the monster card. So you're really just losing a card in terms of advantage, but still this is good enough because if that effect would have resolved, your opponent would have gotten infinite amount of cards, potentially three, four, maybe even five more cards, right? So that's why this is still good. Then even cards like Drone Lockbird is still a negative one. It says when your opponent activ uh, activates a card and adds a card from their deck to their hand outside the draw phase, you can ditch this card as a cost to the graveyard, and then neither players can add cards from the deck for the rest of the turn. So you're still losing a card, but you're trading it with the uh, blanket effect of your opponent potentially adding more cards from their deck, which could hurt you because a lot of combo decks just add a bunch of cards. So you're stopping like a whole thing. But again, you are going negative in terms of card advantage. Unfortunately, that's just how hand traps work. Now, cards that are sided in should generally fulfill the purpose of pushing through your plays through hand traps going first or contributing to the end boards. We kind of went over that. If it's not strong enough, especially if your opponent is siding in board breakers or they're siding in more hand traps to counter you, generally you want to side in cards that can, you know, counter their counters because you know those counters are coming in. And if I didn't play with any side deck cards, I made my normal end board, then their counter side cards might be strong enough to already break my regular end board. So that's why we have to bring in more cards. For example, Manadium players, some are siding in Manadium Reframing going first, just because that just helps strengthen their end board from board breakers like Dark Ruler no more. We have Rika players in the past siding cards like Rivalry of the Warlords, which is a very, very safe card that prevents their player, uh, the opposing player from potentially playing because it says both players have to control the same uh, type and certain decks have various types of different monsters out there. So it pre prevents them from playing. If they stop the Rika player, then the Rika player is very, very safe. And if the Rika player combos, they still have the Rivalry, which is also additional protection so yeah it's a lot to deal with voiceless voice players are also siding in summon limit same kind of notion there they can protect it with the skull guardian so it does not negate and uh in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, you generally want to side in a maximum i would say between three to six cards going first to fulfill this criteria that we talked about so far because you don't want to hinder the consistency of your deck like you do not want to side out engine cards or side deck cards because you're going to be seeing your starters a lot less and not to mention your opponents can be siding in hand traps or board breakers. So if you're not making a consistent board and you're getting stopped by hand traps, you don't have enough other cards to play with, then your opponent's gonna win easily because you're not having a board to kind of protect yourself with. So that's why you generally wanna side out cards instead that are already non-engine cards in your original deck. So cards like hand traps 
we're just effectively siding in better cards for them in the form of trap cards like Summon Limit that are obviously only one dimensional, can only be used going first, but they're a lot stronger going first as opposed to hand traps, which are neg ones, right? So, you know, cards that are traps like Solemn Strike, Solemn Judgment, they do trade one for one with other cards. So you're not losing card advantage. They're a lot more powerful, but the drawback is they only work when you go first, whereas hand traps can work going first or going second. Now you can also uh, side in a little bit more than six cards going first if you're trying to fulfill a condition like cross out designator that actually has to banish the name of a card in your deck in order to negate that specific card that your opponent might be using. So if you're not already main decking cards like Drone Lockbird, you might have to put in one copy just to fulfill the condition of cross out designator. And then more going first tips. So generally, obviously we never side out cards that are in the engine going first. This is especially true in a deck that has a low amount of starters. So. A lot of modern day Yu-Gi-Oh decks generally have a very low amount of starters. For example, if you think about Kastir or Snake Eye, they have maybe like 13 one card starters. But if any of those cards resolve, you basically have the full board. So these decks are very, very consistent and they don't rely on playing additional engine pieces. You play the minimum amount of engine and then the rest of the deck is just all non-engine hand traps or board breakers or cards that allow you to play the defensive and supplement the main engine. Which is why you never want to side out your engine cards, because that percentage chance is already quite low. So if you're taking out your Snake Eye Ash or your Black Witch going first, then you're going to have a very, very low chance of actually drawing those cards and also be uh, resolving those cards against hand traps. Now, we generally want to open two starters slash extenders in modern Yu-Gi-Oh as well because of the existence of hand traps. So if our opponent hand traps one of our monsters, we have the additional extender we can continue playing and then uh, we're just not impeded. So that's why, again, you don't want to hurt the consistency. Really quickly, if you guys aren't already subscribed to the channel, definitely consider hitting that subscribe button at the bottom. It'll go a long way to support the channel. Other than that, thanks a lot for tuning in. And yeah, going first, side decking again is quite easy. Just take out non-engine cards that are already existing in your deck for better non-engine cards. What about siding for going second? Well, this is a little bit different because we obviously want to up our non-engine count with hand traps or board breakers to either prevent our opponent from establishing an end board or to break their board and their disruptions that they might put up. Going second, again, you're on the defensive, so you wanna put in more cards to have more of a chance to draw multiple combinations of those cards to have the highest percentage chance of actually interacting with your opponent. But it can be kind of difficult side decking going second because you obviously don't wanna take out too many engine cards. Unfortunately, going second, I think you are forced to shave down on engine cards in order to meet the criteria because it doesn't make any sense if you're taking out existing hand traps for other hand traps. They might be better hand traps, but still we're gonna have the same amount of chance to draw those hand traps. And generally we want to draw multiple hand traps if we know for a fact that we're going second, right? So that's why I would recommend one solution is to actually shave down on the existing engine cards, which slightly compromises the consistency, but it still allows you to play. Uh, obviously we're drawing an additional card going second, because going first you skip your draw phase, but going second you draw a six card. So that actually does contribute to help consistency. So we can actually cut down a little bit on some cards, knowing that we have a additional percentage chance of drawing a potential starter or a card that'll help us play. So generally this boils down to cutting down on three of, so your core engine still functions, but um, you know you have less of a chance to seeing that, uh, seeing that card because you're playing less than three. And another solution is actually to cut down on an entire engine if your deck plays multiple engines. So for example, the Snake Eye Fire King deck, I know a lot of players going second are actually siding out all of the Fire King engine, which can be as many as six cards. So that can allow you to play six more hand traps or six more board breakers therefore increasing the chances of you opening multiples. I think in the Hyper Geometric Calculator, with 23 hand traps, you have almost 90% chance of actually opening two plus hand traps, which is very, very good when you're going second, because you generally want to open more than one uh, disruption going second. In modern Yu-Gi-Oh, you need at least two uh, on a general level to try and stop your opponent from playing. So when do you side hand traps versus board breakers? This is... Uh, Kind of a conundrum because they kind of fulfill different roles right typically we want to side mostly hand traps or mostly board breakers you don't kind of want to have a mix in between both because they kind of conflict with each other if you think about it you can stop your opponent potentially with hand traps but then they might not have an end board so your board breakers could be completely dead if, for example we had cards like dark ruler no more and they don't have anything to negate or if we have cards like Dark Hole and they don't have any monsters on the board but they have a bunch of hand traps in their hand well the Dark Hole is just a useless card right so that's why you should traditionally lean towards one or the other for the most part. Hand traps are for more when a format has decks that have end boards that either can FTK you or basically pseudo FTK you. And by what I mean by that is they build like an unbreakable board. 
that has a combination of multiple cards. Um, their end board basically scatters disruption between the hand, field, and the graveyard, so board breakers cannot trade favorably into everything. And they probably gain insane advantage along the way and have insane follow up. So if you don't OTK them, you're probably losing. For example, Snake Eye Fire King, they end with multiple disruptions in the graveyard, on the field, they have hand traps in the hand, and they have five plus cards in the hand. So even if you board break her, you're not really trading with any card advantage because all of that was free. It came out from their engine. That's just how disgustingly powerful their engine was. So there's no real point trying to board breaker them. Basically, you have to have multiple board breakers that fulfill different purposes that trade with the graveyard, like soul release, trade with the hand and trade with the field. And you basically have to draw that specific combination of board breakers to even have a minuscule chance, which is why hand traps are just better to stop them from establishing that end board and then just grinding away what little resources they have left after the smoke settles. Now, board breakers are more for when a format has decks whose end boards can be dismantled consistently using a small combination of board breakers, right? So uh, for example, when a deck basically puts all of the resources in their hand to put up an end board that has interactions just on the field or in the graveyard in one location, and they also have very little follow-up. They expended all of their resources in their hand to set up that end board, and you playing a combination of um, board breakers can just disrupt that board, and then even if they live on their next turn, they don't have enough cards to kind of push through whatever else you put out on the board, right? So that's, I would say, the important distinguish between the two. So, hand traps versus board breakers, a little more talking about that. Board breakers often work when played in low amounts with hand traps, so you can't actually mix them. It doesn't have to explicitly just be hand traps or board breakers, but the board breakers that you mix with hand traps should generally have other usages aside from one purpose. For example, cards like Dark Ruler, it might not be great because it only does one thing. Whereas you have cards like Triple Tactics Talent that is able to steal monsters, it can rip cards from the hand. It can let you draw cards and it's basically useful even when your opponent does not have an actual board, right? So we have a lot of modes with this card and all of these modes are playable despite what the game state is as long as it fulfills the condition of our opponent actually activating a monster effect, right? And, you know, board breakers can actually sometimes be useful though uh, from a high level perspective when hand traps are actually prevalent and players are actually playing cards to prevent hand traps. So cards like Cross Act Designator, Called by the Grave, Triple Attack is Talent to rip a card out of their hand after they get hand trapped. And there have been players that just play entirely board breakers in a metagame like that because they anticipated people trying to counter hand traps. And then cards like Cross Act Designator just don't really have any usage against board breakers because they're just never activating hand traps against their opponent, right? We're just like always have board breakers. So those cards are just never really live for them. So that's just one thing you can do to counter the metagame. But uh, again, make sure that you're kind of leaning towards either board breakers or hand traps, personally, I would say. All right, moving on, let's talk about side decking going second with hand traps. So although hand traps are normally played in the main deck because they're already good going first and second, there are certain hand traps that actually live mainly in the side deck. And these hand traps typically tend to be more specific. They cover niche interactions and are sometimes dead against certain matchups but very, very powerful against others, right? You have cards like Ghost Spell that kind of stop an opponent's card from interacting with the graveyard, but not every deck interacts with the graveyard. Sure, this is good against decks like Labyrinth, but it might be completely dead against other decks that don't use the graveyard at all, right? Then, of course, there are cards like Phantasme, the Fantastical Dragon, that are very good against Link decks, but against decks that do not require links, like purely, it just doesn't do anything. So that's why it's a little bit better side deck. There's also cards like Spooky Dogwood that are only useful for a certain uh, interaction or a scenario, AKA gaining life points when you're close to time. And then certain hand traps are actually weaker than others, but can fulfill a similar purpose, right? So players might decide to increase the chances of them seeing a hand trap, knowing that they're gonna be going second, as opposed to going in a blind game one where they're, they don't know if they're going first or second with the die roll, right? So if you know you're going second for a fact, you might, might wanna side in more hand traps. So players have been siding cards like Ghost Mourner already when they're playing Effect Veiler and Infinite Impermanence in their main deck, but they know they're going second. So they're like, okay, I wanna play more copies of Effect Veiler slash Imperm. This is the next best thing, I'll side it in. I've also included some popular hand traps in this document. So if you guys wanna check it out, you can definitely see that um, just uh, on the Patreon again, or you can screenshot this if you like. These are some popular hand traps that players have played. And there are a lot more that have been waiting to be discovered. There are a lot of hand traps in the game a lot of people don't know about, and they end up being good somehow when a new card or a new interaction comes out that just happens to work into that hand trap. What about going second with board breakers? So board breakers are obviously Specifically to break apart your opponent's end board, so you can either OTK or build your own board after the smoke clears. 
The board breakers for the most part are either normal spells or monsters that can basically not be used during the opponent's turn. But there are some cards that are quick play spells like enemy controllers, super polymerization, dinosaurs, or panker tops that do have some usage against uh, your opponent's turn. But none of these obviously can be played on the opponent's first turn. So if your opponent goes first, none of these are useful because they cannot be played on the hand traps. Now, often these cards also have a certain requirement or a cost that has to be met or fulfilled before they can actually be played. For example, Dino Wrestler Pankertops or Cyber Dragon actually require your opponent to control a monster before they can be special summoned, right? So there are some conditions that have to be met in order for these cards to be played because they generally are quite powerful against the uh, right interaction. Also, cards like Enemy Controller that have to tribute a monster for a cost to take control of one. Uh, Super Polymerization, you have to discard a card. So there are some drawbacks with these cards. There's also a list of popular board breakers, so you guys can take a look at this. You have a bunch of different board breakers, mostly spell cards, but there are also some monsters like the Kaijus, the Wrestler Panker Tops. They evenly match as well as a really, really popular one that's uh, a trap card. Okay, Siding Time Cards. This is very interesting because uh, for those guys that don't know, current rounds in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! are 45 minutes long. It used to be 40 minutes, but they changed it to 45 minutes because they realized how complex the game has gotten. And, you know, players are always going into time. Now, once the timer hits zero, the turn player, whosever turn it is when the timer is called, must finish their current phase. And then after that phase ends, both players actually compare their life points to see which is higher. And the player with the higher life points wins that game. Um, if it's a tie, then both players are considered to be a draw, unless it's in the top cut of a um, competitive tournament where you actually get three turns each. Now, this obviously was different back in the day. Back in the day, both players would both get three turns each, but they recently changed it. So it's its new time rule after 2018. And uh, obviously, this causes players to uh, have thought about strategies to win in time and you can actually side in cards that affect life points directly either via burning your opponent or by increasing your own life points there are a lot of cards that say if this card uh, does x then inflict x damage to your opponent or gain x life points and generally these cards are actually searchable or accessible through the deck's core engine whether that means they're uh, in an extra deck slot or if they're in the main deck but they can be searched somehow since the graveyard uh, extra deck monsters like Beatrice can actually send Volcanic Scattershot or cards like Skullmark Ladybug, which allow you to gain 1,000 life points or burn your opponent for 500 damage. There are also players using other extra deck cards like Agave Dragon that allows you to burn your opponent for 100 damage. So traditionally, they are involved with cards in the extra deck because those are just easily accessible at any time. You don't have to search for anything. You just have to fulfill having X amount of monsters on the field to make that extra deck monster, and then you can fulfill that monster's effect, and then that allows you to either burn your opponent or gain life points. So... Interesting to note that this is definitely a thing that a lot of players are citing in order to account for time approaching. What about general side decking tips? Got a couple of quick ones for you guys. So the must knows of side decking, you obviously have three minutes to side deck between the rounds, but just because you have three minutes does not mean you're legally able to exercise the right to take all three minutes, okay? You cannot use this time to explicitly stall out your opponent. This is something that I think a lot of people uh, don't realize, but if a judge thinks you're deliberately stalling while side decking, you can be penalized or even DQ'd and banned from the event. Yes, there have actually been people who have been DQ'd and also banned for years because they decided to try and stall by taking advantage of the side decking three minutes. So guys, you have three minutes aside, but you have to side at a reasonable pace. You cannot do it explicitly to stall. So make sure that you do account for that. You can also watch your opponents while they side deck to see exactly how many cards they're bringing in. Sometimes this is useful because a lot of players when they're siding, they just kind of do the thing where they take out the cards, they put in the cards, and it's very uh, easy to see what cards are being sided in. So this is completely legal, and then this could give you uh, a good idea of what your opponent might be side decking in. Like if you're going second, your opponent is putting in three cards, you could be like, oh, okay, maybe they're putting in three summon limit. Maybe I should tweak my siding based on that. Because you can tweak your siding as long as you've not yet presented your deck. Once you've presented your deck, then you cannot side any longer. Then the, uh, your deck is basically as is. The final product is there. Now, some players, in order to circumvent this, actually place their entire 15 card side deck into their deck shuffle everything and then take out 15 cards including the remainder cards in their side deck and also cards in their main deck that they wanted to take out anyways this is a really really good way to prevent your opponent from making a read and seeing how many cards exactly you're siding in for the matchup it's 100 percent legal uh, i know not a lot of people do it because it's just extra work having to go through your deck and find 15 cards but a lot of people do um do this when they do want their opponent not to make a read on them 
And then again, extra deck cards can also be sided, but they must be in matching sleeves. For example, if we wanted to side like an Agave Dragon for time, it has to be in the matching sleeve as the rest of our side deck. If our extra deck is double sleeved, then you have to actually take out the double sleeve of an extra deck monster when you're putting that other monster in. And then the newly sleeved dub, uh, extra deck monster is in your extra deck. And the one that was in your extra deck before is in your side deck. You just take out the extra deck sleeve. So again, the sleeve that's on the inside, the inner sleeve has to be the same as your side deck as well. So that's just one thing to note. But you can side deck extra deck monsters as many as you want if uh, certain extra deck monsters like Abyss Dweller or whatever do come up against certain matchups and you might want to bring them in. And of course, last but not least, have a side deck plan in place. When you're preparing for a competitive event, you should always have a side deck pattern already rehearsed and kind of in your mind, which means you should know exactly what cards to take out for a given matchup, both going first and second. Uh, I would say account for all of the existing popular matchups, so all of the popular tier 1 decks, maybe a couple of the tier 2 decks as well. For example, my Fire King deck, I side out one Ash Blossom, one Imperm, one Nibiru, one Baylor, all the hand traps, and then I put in three copies of Crossout Designator and one copy of Drone Lockbird when I go first. And then going second, I side out two copies of Black Witch, one one for one, one Fire King, Avatar Kirin, and a Sanctuary. And then I have a list of five cards that I put in that are good going second for a given matchup. I already have that in mind. For example, against Voices, I might put in Cosmic Cyclone, uh, Typhoons. Against the Mirror Match, I might put in Cosmic Cyclones as well. So just have a good idea of what you want to do. Obviously, you don't have to know everything because there are surprising strategies in the tournament. That's what makes it fun. You know, competitive players are always looking for an edge and you might not be prepared for that edge or whatever strategy they have or the deck even but that's okay just uh you know adapt on the fly this is something that you definitely have to do but again having a proper side deck pattern in mind at least for the rest of the decks in the strategy will help you in the long run so you're not wasting valuable time siding uh you're not still playing and you know exactly what to put in and what to account for and uh, of course, you cannot bring notes or write down a side deck pattern. I know you can do this in other card games like Magic the Gathering, but in Yu-Gi-Oh! you cannot do this at a competitive event. There's no note taking. So make sure you do have this memorized and just practice study as if you, you know, you had an exam or a midterm coming up. This is just something that you should rehearse and already account for in your playtesting. And then a uh, fun little thing that uh, I wanted to include in here is called smoke screen siding. So in the past, a lot of players have actually tried a technique called smoke screen siding, which basically involves you siding out an existing engine in the main deck for a completely separate 15 card engine. And then after siding, you basically have a completely different deck. Yeah, this is a really, really fun thing. Uh, basically you, for example, would side out in this picture here, we have a chain burn deck. You would side out all the chain burn cards and put in the insector cards. So when your opponent sided in anti burn cards in game two and game three, they're kind of uh, left with a bunch of dead anti burn cards because you're not playing burn anymore, you're playing an insector deck. So that's just something that people have tried in the past. Now, to my knowledge, this has never seen success in competitive play just because you're sacrificing basically your entire side deck for the novelty of bringing in, you know, a completely different deck, right? So that means you're not going to be able to play counter cards against your opponent's matchups. And uh, later on in the tournament, people will know what you're playing if you're at the top table. So they're going to be able to scout and see what you're doing. And then this will not come as a surprise anymore. So that just loses its surprise factor and becomes a lot worse when people just say, oh, okay, you're going to side in the deck of cards. I'm not going to side in anti-burn cards because I know you're going that route. So... It was a cool thing that a lot of people have tried in the past, but as of right now, it's just not very, uh, it's, it's something that's been just power crept and not very relevant. And then best of all, you can actually use the hypergeometric calculator for side decking. The hypergeometric calculator is actually a great tool to approximate the chances of you opening a certain card in your deck. And this allows you to enter a couple of things. Here's basically how it works. You plug in number of values to spit out percentages. So for example, this one I'm using is on Aether Hub. It's originally designed for Magic the Gathering, but uh, it's very useful for Yu-Gi-Oh. This is really, really cool because it shows you exactly what percentage of uh, the odds of you drawing X amount of cards are. So what we have here is uh, basically four categories. The population size is your deck count. So let's say 40 cards because we're playing Yu-Gi-Oh. Sample size is the amount of cards that we're actually drawing in our opening hands. So let's say five in this case because we opened with five. Successes in population is the number of cards you want that's actually in the entire deck. So let's say we're trying to calculate what's the chances of us drawing two hand traps. Well, we play 15 hand traps in the deck, so we put 15 here. And then successes in sample is the amount of cards you actually want to see. So let's say we want to draw two hand traps going second. This is a chance of us seeing two hand traps on average, around 60%. 
Just bear in mind that this does not account for duplicates. Now, there are a lot of hand traps that you can only activate one per turn. For example, Ash Blossom, Joy Spring, or Ghost Bell. So this actual percentage of you seeing a mixture of the two hand traps is slightly lower. It only accounts for seeing two of any hand trap. So that's just one thing to note. But again, it really puts things into perspective. So I've been using this a lot, especially for deck building. It's really, really handy. Okay, moving on. Yeah, again, this kind of goes over. Everything's in the slide. There's a link to it as well, or you guys can just Google Hypermetric Calculator. Uh, it's really, really useful also for counting starters as well. And just like deck building, I really, really recommend this tool. It's really, really handy and it's free. And yeah, that's about it for this slide. Um, if you guys really like this, again, uh, check out some of my stuff. I have the Squiddy store. We have a lot of t-shirts and there be some new designs that are going to be launched. I've hand-drawn these myself. So if you guys uh, appreciate uh, fellow struggling artist, definitely check that out. Also, I have a Patreon. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm going to be uploading these slides as well as a lot of in-depth deck building guides to that Patreon. So go ahead and check out the tiers. This slide in particular will be available for all the patrons. So you can go ahead and uh, definitely check that out. If you want to level up your competitive Yu-Gi-Oh game, this is definitely something I would uh, recommend. I'm going to try uh, making some more stuff for it. You can contact me on Discord, NewMan93. If you want coaching, they have uh, Metify as well private one-for-one -one coaching with me. Um, um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. If you have any other requests or any suggestions, if you guys appreciated this, definitely leave a like and subscribe. Other than that, I'll see you guys in the next video content video. And yeah, I hope you guys learned something out of this. Thanks for tuning in.